joined right now by my friend Chase. Uh, welcome to Cop Block Cam, Chase. Hey, Pete. It's good to be here. How are you doing? Doing pretty well, man. I, I guess we can start out if you want to share a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background, um, let folks know who you are. <clears throat> yeah, sure. My name is Chase Rachels, and um, before I got into the liberty activism movement, I was a uh, uh, Air Force veteran. I was an intelligence analyst, so I did a lot of geopolitical analysis there. So I have somewhat of a similar background that's kind of relevant to what we do now. But since then, I've become a pretty avid voluntarist or anarcho capitalist, as you might call it. Not too long ago, we posted one of your videos on Cop Block, and some folks were real receptive to it, and some were uh, questioned certain aspects of it. But I guess, uh, could you give a brief overview on your perspective on uh, what a what a better alternative to the current uh, criminal justice system law enforcement might be? Oh, absolutely, Pete. So the first thing we really need to do is just analyze, you know, what is the state? And we need to look at the incentives the state has in the current setup. So right now, with, with the state, how it's concerned, uh, it's actually in their best interest to kind of let crime fester and, and get worse because as crime gets worse, they're able to justify an expanded budget, Right. So whereas, you know, if you had a private defense agency or insurance agency, which might be the one providing it, every time there's an increase in crime in the area or there's stolen property or aggression, then they're going to be uh, paying out the bills to their insured clients. So it's in their best interest to prevent the crime, whereas in the cop scenario, it's in their best interest to, to let it fester. And not only that, but the cops are, you know, they're guaranteed to be paid since they get all their funding from taxes, whereas the private insurance agency has to rely on the continued patronage of its customers. Right on, yeah. I've actually also heard, uh, you know, both if the police, if the status quo let the crime happen, so then they can say, hey, we need more funds or we need more, a larger scope of authority. Um, but conversely, they may also say, oh, crime is so low, we've done so good, give us more resources so we can continue this trend so either way you know <laughs> oh yeah well that's i mean it's set that way very deliberately um like you said if crime is low then they'll take credit for that they won't give credit to that to the market or peaceful voluntary interaction they'll take credit for themselves just like if there's any sort of economic surpluses or booms then they're going to take credit for that with their economic policies and then when there's any sort of failure in the economy they're going to say it's a, a free market failure right Right on, yeah, and I think you touch you touch on something I think is really a key to this whole conversation, which is incentives. And do you, could you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so um, now I'm not trying to say this is how things are gonna absolutely be run in a voluntary society, but here's are some uh, kind of uh, general considerations that need be, that need to be made. Now, most likely, the agencies that are gonna be responsible for providing defense is gonna be insurance agencies, right? Just like. Uh, we have insurance for our cars and for our homeowners insurance. We might have uh, defense insur insurance agencies, which guarantee that uh, you know you're not going to get any stolen property. If you, if your property does get stolen, then we're going to compensate you for that if you can make a legitimate claim for it. And um, they're going to be providing their own defense security teams to make sure all of this crime is prevented. There, therefore, th th in that way, I'm sorry, in that way, they don't have to actually. Uh, pay you for any stolen property if it never gets stolen in the first place. And even if it does get stolen, right, it's going to be in their incentive to find, investigate, and apprehend the criminal who stole it because that way if they find him, they can make him pay for your stolen goods as opposed to uh, themselves. So in this manner, the incentives are lined up such that the insurance company not only wants to prevent crime, but also has a great incentive to retrieve stolen property and provide restitution to the, to the victimized uh, client. Right on. Yeah, that, that that makes sense to me. Um, I, I also think it's important, and incentives plays into this as well. But to the, uh, the what I would say is like the seen and the unseen. It's important to think, you know, to think about what exists today and, and how does that, why does that crime exist, and then what might exist under a free society. You know, I would like point to things like if if drug prohibition didn't exist, or a lot of the economic factors that that really hinder the economy and act as that retards the economy, and, and those things would be. Um, not in existence, and I would think uh, crime would therefore be lower. Is that? Oh no, Pete, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, you know, what is most of our really violent uh, a crime being uh, derived from? It's it's from uh, the sell of prohibited items, and when you prohibit an item, whether it's uh, you know weed or any sort of drugs or anything else, then what you're doing is you're kind of giving to criminals a monopoly and a silver platter because no legitimate business owner is going to be 
providing these uh, items since it's illegal. So now you kind of give a silver platter monopoly to people with nefarious intentions, whether they're terrorist groups or uh, organized crime syndicates or, or, or cartels. So you're absolutely right. When everything is legal, or when not legalized, when everything is able to be freely traded, there's not going to be any lucrative prospects for these criminal organizations to take advantage of, and therefore they'll never accrue the kind of power they have nowadays, which allows them to be as violent as they are. And not only that, but they won't even have the incentive to be either. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, how, how would you say... I, I, well, I know some folks may watch this and they may take issue or may have a sort of a negative knee-jerk reaction to the use of the word private, you know, just, and I think maybe some of that's due to the uh, government school indoctrination and the mainstream media and the quasi-public-private entities that exist today, but could you um, maybe unpack that word and... and uh, yeah, you know, um, this whole, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Pete. Um, you, you think about private defense agencies, people are thinking about like Blackwater or something like that. But no, I mean, they're, they're, in Blackwater and organizations like that, they're given, they're privatized profits, but they're able to socialize their liabilities since they're under the umbrella of the government contracts. And also they can even kind of socialize their losses if they, if they want to, too. So under a purely free market society, however, if in the pursuit of uh, justice, these defense agencies end up uh, kind of damaging someone else's property, then they're going to be held liable to, to pay reparations for that property, right? They're going to be held legally liable too. And there's also going to be a, a system of arbitration networks. Now, an, ar an arbiter is simply just kind of the equivalent of what we have today as a judge or a jury, right? So the difference is in this kind of society is that before you enter into any place, whether it's a commercial area or a residential area, they're going to have standard codes of conduct. So by you entering in there, you are giving your willing consent to abide by these, and there will also be an associated set of, uh, of punishments for any sort of violations of these, right? And so if you violate any of these terms, you're sent to arbitration, an arbiter which both you as a defendant and the plaintiff as the prosecutor agree upon. Therefore, any rulings made by this arbiter is going to be com uh, is going to be constituted beforehand by both parties. This is in direct contrast to what we have now as a social contract under the state system, to where laws are in place imposed upon us regardless of our consent. So in this way, all the incentives are lined up properly financially. Everyone has the incentive to prevent crime, and also all the laws you're subjugated to are laws that you agree to yourself voluntarily and explicitly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's uh, again incentives come into play, and uh, like you pointed out with the Blackwater reference, it's uh, it means that uh, ultimately the individual actor who acted in the wrong is is ultimately responsible, and uh, it sounds like reputation and things like that come into play quite a bit. But I guess the uh, million dollar question I have: uh, how do, how do we get there? What's the best way? Well, you know, Pete, there's a lot of. Uh... A lot of different theories out there, but you know, my top two choices is well, first and foremost is going to be raising our children differently. You know, raising our children in a nonviolent capacity, teaching them reason and rationality and critical thinking, as opposed to just rote memorization and submission. And and once they're uh, raised in a, a very reasoned, rational based uh, environment, they're going to be able to see the inherent contradictions in the state and the and the logical fallacies of the state. And without any support by the populace it controls, the state's just going to kind of vanish, right? Because the state needs the support of its constituents in order to survive. Now, the second thing what we can do now and today is, well, what I like to do at least, is to kind of take some of these more complex concepts. You might see them from the Mises Institute about, you know, uh, different aspects of freedom, what it is, what it means, what it entails, and kind of be able to translate them to the everyday layman's terms to the general populace. Make it very digestible and easy for them to, to understand. And that's what I kind of try to do with my videos. I know when we talk about voluntarist or anarcho-capitalist society, it sends up a lot of red flags and people are thinking about Mad Max and flamethrowers and, you know, Master Blaster going around. But really, uh, they have basic questions about what about national defense? What about the environment? What about this? So I try to give people at least some plausible ways of how these things could be handled in a free society. Not not to say that this is how they will happen, but just to reassure them that there are ways that this can work. And not only can it work, but it can work much uh, more effectively than in our current state society. And it's always important when you talk about these things to make the person compare 
the stateless society, not to a utopia as they always do, because they always say, well, here's an imperfection, because there's all going to be imperfections, but they need to compare it to what we have now as a state, what the state is actually doing. Not what it's saying it's doing, but what it's actually doing. That's, I that's, think that's so key. That's a great point. Um, you know, we're going to have to wrap this up in a second. I know we've, we've covered a lot of ground quickly, but uh, it's clear you, you're um, – you seem very genuine about your advocacy of these things. It's clear that you've thought about them, and uh, you know uh, your background. I think uh, brings a lot to the table. Um, would you? What? What other outlets? I know you mentioned the Mises Institute, but if folks want to learn more about this sort of uh, perspective, and you know, really think critically about it, because it is such a different perspective for so many people, uh, because it's not one that's communicated in the mainstream media or in their schools again, or, or even from you know a lot of people in their sphere. So, what other outlets or resources would you point people to? Well, first of all, I'll go ahead and plug my own channel, I guess. Uh, so you can find find some of my videos at YouTube.com/ancapchase. That's A N C A P C H A S E. Also, one of my favorite go-to spots is Free Domain Radio, and that's going to be Stefan Molyneux hosting that show. He talks about a lot of the same issues that I do from a very philosophical first principles perspective. And then uh, Mises.org is, again, one of my favorite spots. And, I mean, there's, there's, there's half a dozen places you can go to find this stuff. But but those are probably my my uh, top three for sure. Right on, right on, Chase. Definitely a lot of solid content in all those outlets. Um, well, I appreciate your time, and I'm sure we'll hear more from you in the future. All right, thanks, B. I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs>